Okay, so what are the major factors that do influence bacterial lifestyle or, or the ecological niche? They mean basically the same thing. So what are the factors? Well, the, the, I'm going to make a list here and then we'll go through them to understand them and how much they matter. Water is the top one. Nothing can grow without water and that is the thing. Temperature can put strong limits on growth. So inside a volcano where the temperature is 500 degrees Celsius, nothing will grow. If the temperature is, I don't know, minus 100 degrees, nothing will grow. Even in between there, there is a, a wide range of temperatures where different microorganisms are specialized for growing at different temperatures, and we will see that. The oxygen concentration is a big one that we care about um, because a lot of bacteria that affect our lives directly um, can be controlled to some extent by controlling the amount of oxygen in the environment. And we can understand a lot of the bacteria that live in us and on us and some of what they do based on oxygen. Um, pH is uh, another thing. Um, some bacteria in archaea specialize at growing in very acidic environments or very basic environments, but most of the ones we think about hang out in neutral environments. And then availability of nutrients is a more complicated factor. We're going to look at a lot of different nutrients and we're going to really understand what they do with them. Um, and that is going to bring us partway to lecture four. And lecture four, we're going to kind of finish this list with energy metabolism and electron acceptors. And all of that will make more sense when we get there. So let's start with the first one, water. Water is absolutely important for growth. I mean, just think about like in a kitchen, dry food is stable. Uncooked rice generally is not going to get moldy. Um, but anything else, something wet, like a bowl of soup or juice or something like that, has to go in a refrigerator where we use the low temperature to limit uh, microbial growth. In a refrigerator, what we're doing is we're, we're preventing um, growth of organisms that can grow in us at our body temperature. Those, those organisms cannot grow in a refrigerator for the most part. So... Most cells need a very narrow water activity, and water activity is a measure of water availability. So it's like the water concentration, so to speak. Um, in chemical reactions that involve water, they are going to be affected by the water activity. So for example, distilled water, fresh water, they have the highest possible water activity. There's nothing in them that would prevent an organism from getting water. Um, salt water has a much lower water activity. The salt prevents that water from being available to some extent. And so on the following slide, um, we're going to see some uh, water activities of foods. You don't have to memorize them, but I want you to look at the order and think about how often do those foods or those materials grow microorganisms. Um, so some examples of this are that most organisms cannot grow in dry foods or even jellies. Jellies have such high concentration of sugars that um, the water is not very available to most microorganisms. And there's some special fungi that can grow in jellies before, before bacteria ever would. Um, we have some xerophiles and halophiles, and they grow sort of in the same places, low water activity, high salt concentrations. But these are bizarre. We never really interact with them because they would never affect a human. This is the table of water activities. Um, with pure water up here and a few specialized bacteria that can grow in pure water. Um, salt water would be down here. And there are organisms that grow fine in, 
in seawater, there's a huge ecological niche in the oceans, um, but you couldn't put these bacteria in the ocean and you couldn't put these bacteria in pure water. Likewise, um, our human blood, our own cells, would not survive in pure water or seawater. Um, and pathogens that we worry about, that a lot of pathogens that can infect our bloodstream, for example, can grow at this water activity. Then when we get to lower and lower water activities, we really restrict what can grow. Um, so as we get down to things like preserved meats and jams, we're looking at more um, fungi, not bacteria. And when we look at salt lakes or salted foods, we're thinking about um, very specific members of the archaea. And cereals, we're seeing some really bizarre fungi that I've probably never even seen. So the takeaway from this more than the numbers, the numbers don't matter, and and you don't need to know these these examples, but you should know that these down here are not going to support growth of bacteria, where anything from this up could support bacterial growth. So there could be bacteria growing in these, whereas things like this, probably not. And that's why we salt fish. That's why we salt meat because it prevents bacteria from growing in it and spoiling it. Um, and so that salt, the effect of that salt is to drive down the water activity. Okay, that's when you salt something to preserve it, you are driving down the water activity and preventing bacteria from growing in it. Okay, so that is water activity. That's probably the main thing um, that we think about for controlling bacteria. Um, and then temperature is a big one. And why would temperature matter? Well, this is where we think about some physiology and we think about proteins getting denatured at high temperature. We think about membranes becoming too fluid at high temperature and falling apart. Um, at low temperatures, membranes can't move and the proteins in them can't move. And proteins stick together in the wrong way at low temperature. Um, so at these extremes is where organisms need to come up with special ways to deal with these problems. So bacteria and archaea that grow at high heat have special proteins and special membranes that um, survive the high heat. Bacteria and archaea that grow in the cold have ways of increasing their membrane fluidity and they can protect their proteins. And the, the key thing here is that microorganisms can't regulate their temperature, and they generally can't migrate to a better temperature. Instead, they're either going to die, or if the temperature is right, they're able to grow. And so they, they specialize in growing when the proper temperature exists. There are five different broad groups of organisms based on their temperature profile. So what is this graph showing you. This is the maximum growth rate, so how fast they could double. Um, a high number here would be like a fast growth rate, so a short doubling time, and a low number would be a slow growth rate or long doubling time. And so again, we're really looking at the fastest these organisms can grow. Um, and some organisms, yeah, some thermophiles their fastest growth occurs around temperature of 62 degrees Celsius. That's almost hot enough to burn a person. Not quite. That would be uncomfortably warm. We are mesophiles, and all the bacteria that can grow in us are mesophiles, and they specialize at growing at 37 degrees Celsius, our body temperature. We have hyperthermophiles that are truly bizarre, and we find them growing in hydrothermal vents in the ocean. Um, some of them can easily grow in boiling water. These are the bacteria I showed you from Yellowstone National Park. They can easily grow in boiling water. Um, this is an old graph. Um, it really should go up to, I think, 130 
because they found some hyperthermophiles that can survive higher temperatures than that and grow at maybe 120 Celsius, so way above boiling. These organisms are amazing, but they don't have any relevance to your health because you are never exposed, typically, to hot water like that in the environment, and these could never grow in your blood. They would experience your blood as being freezing cold. Likewise, psychrotrophs and psychrophiles have temperature optima of like a refrigerator or um, cold water in Greenland or Antarctica. And these would have difficulty growing in your blood because it would, the temperature would be too high for them and it would tend to denature their proteins and destroy their membranes. Um, so these are the five groups, and you should know that they exist. You should definitely know the names of these things. Um, and we will actually see pathogens that are psychrotrophs that can grow in a refrigerator. We will see pathogens that are mesophiles, and we will see pathogens that are thermophiles. Like, um, there is a member of the Clostridia, Clostridia perfringens, can grow in beef gravy at that temperature with the fastest known doubling time. Fastest I'm aware of, at least. Um, so that's a thing. And this, this also brings up some interesting um, terminology because file, like thermo means heat, psychro means cold, file means loving, troph means growing. So a psychrotroph grows at cold temperatures, a psychrophile loves cold temperatures. Um, so psychrotrophs grow at cold temperatures, psychrophiles love cold temperatures, and generally we don't have that kind of troph thing going elsewhere. This slide just gives you examples. So if, you, if you're familiar with um, Listeria monocytogenes or Bacillus, or Clostridium perfringens, this is where they are. But don't worry about these um, examples. Okay, so the last topic for this video is going to be oxygen usage. And we care a lot about oxygen usage because we live in an oxygenated environment. But our bodies internally have very little free oxygen. So we constantly are exposed to bacteria outside of us that need oxygen and inside us that don't need oxygen. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, oxygen is a double-edged sword. We use it, we need it, but it's toxic to our cells, so we have to have systems to detoxify it. Um, and it's very toxic to all cells. Some, some bacteria use it, and some don't, and they, they all need to have some very specific oxygen concentration in their environment, or most of them do. And there are like five different patterns that we see among um, microorganisms that describe how they use oxygen. And these you absolutely must know, because we will use these words whenever we describe human pathogens. And there are human pathogens in all of these groups. So the different groups are obligate aerobes. Obligate means they need it, and aerobe means oxygen. So they require oxygen for growth. You are an obligate aerobe. Your muscle cells are not, but your, your neurons are, and therefore you are an obligate aerobe. Uh, the opposite of that is an obligate anaerobe. So they, they are killed by oxygen. And the bacteria that make um, methane in your distal colon or in um, sediments, flooded soils, stuff like that, those methanogens are killed by oxygen. Um, and then these are all in between. So facultative anaerobes are, are also common, and they can grow... They don't need oxygen to grow. So if there's no oxygen, they're still okay. But if oxygen becomes available, they use it and it helps them. And so Escherichia, like E. coli, is like this. 
um, Saccharomyces bread yeast is like this. Um, less common are microaerophiles. What they need is a very specific low concentration of oxygen. And they'll typically be adapted to growing in water where there is a constant low concentration of oxygen. So like in a lake or river. Um, these, I, we don't see many examples of these among the human pathogens. We see all of these. And we also see aerotolerant anaerobes. These don't use oxygen and they don't care if it's present because, because they can detoxify it easily. So the streptococcus bacteria are like, the, are like this. Um, yeah, and we will come back to a lot of this in lecture four when we talk about fermentation and anaerobic respiration. But for now, I want to show you something cool. Thioglycolate agar is a type of uh, growth medium that is solid, and it lets us see which of these patterns mystery bacteria fall into. So if we have a type of bacteria we want to study and we want to know which of those five patterns it falls into, um, a tool we can use to answer that question is thioglycolate agar. So what you do is you mix the cells with molten agar. So it's, it's warm and the agar, we haven't talked about agar much, but agar is, um, it's a carbohydrate that solidifies in water at a certain temperature. So when it's hot, it, it dissolves in water and stays liquid. So you mix cells with it. Um, you put some nutrients in there and you put thioglycolate in there and cells. Um, once, once it cools, the cells, or it solidifies and the bacteria are trapped wherever they were. And so if you do it right, there aren't very many cells in there, but there are some everywhere in the tube. And if they like the oxygen concentration where they end up, they're going to reproduce. They're going to divide and grow. If they can't grow because of that oxygen concentration, you'll never see them because that first cell will just sit there and probably die. But if they can grow, they will reproduce until there are so many cells that they become visible as cloudy growth in the tube. Um, and so how does this oxygen, how do these oxygen concentrations come about? Well, thioglycolate is a molecule that reacts with oxygen and it removes it from the solution. And that sets up an oxygen gradient. So at the surface, Oxygen can diffuse into the ag agar, and so there's oxygen at the surface. At the bottom, there's no oxygen. So cells can grow if they have the right amount of oxygen in their location. So let's look at these examples. Um, let's look at what thioglycolate shows us. So what kind of microorganism would this be? Well, what we're seeing is a test tube with thioglycolate agar and there's cells everywhere but the only cells that could grow and become visible um, of this we, all of the cells in here sorry are one species and the only one from that species that can grow and become visible are the ones at the top and that's where oxygen is constantly diffusing in so there's oxygen here so these are obligate aerobes this would be the opposite, where um, any cells up here would be killed by oxygen, and any cells through here would be killed by oxygen. And really, you'd start seeing growth here and down. So these are obligate anaerobes. These would be facultative anaerobes, where they can grow a little bit everywhere in the tube. They don't care if there's oxygen or not. But up at the top, where there's plenty of oxygen, they use it, and they can grow faster. These are microaerophiles. They just like this tiny concentration of air, of oxygen, sorry. And then aerotolerant anaerobes really don't care about oxygen. It doesn't matter to them. So that is, um, that's enough for this video. 
Um, take your time with it. Make sure you understand this stuff. Remember, you're going for understanding, and in situations like this, you're going for applying. Because I could, I could ask you to draw um, a thioglycolate tube that shows what obligate aerobes would do. Um, for example. So, I will see you at the next video.